Today's sermon is entitled, Better Love Than Mine, Knowing a Good Deal When You See One. You know, sometimes you see, see people whip a crowd up into a frenzy. Who loves Jesus? And everybody goes, yeah. And, and I, I think that can be good. Uh, can be. But I'm always thinking, yeah, boy, my love is pathetic. I think I can honestly tell you I love Jesus more than anything. And that's such a wretched, miserable, selfish, self-centered love. I, uh, I'm so glad that his love for me is better than my love for him. What a, what a horrible situation we would be in. Imagine if God loved you as much as you love him. Wouldn't that be lousy? Boy, I'd hate that. Think about you sometimes, Dan. God, can we talk? I'm a little busy watching this show right now. Imagine if we had to fight for God's attention. Better love than mine, hallelujah. Better love than mine, knowing a good deal when you see one. Why turn your back on this kind of love? Why walk away from this kind of love? Did you know that uh, the moment you turn to God in faith, it said, God, I can see I'm messed up. I've treated people pretty bad. I've thought some thoughts, Lord, a lot of them. Just horrible. Lord, I've said some things. I can't believe they came out of my mouth. The moment you said, forgive me, this cross, you, you actually bled, you gave yourself to pay for my sin. I, I want that, and I want to say thank you. The moment that happened, the blood of Jesus Christ covered all your sins. Now, the blood of Jesus Christ transcends time. God has transcended. Do you know when God accepted you, he wasn't just forgiving your past sins. God already knew all the garbage that you would do in the future. God already knew how you would treat badly the people he died for, people he loves, and you would treat them so bad and, and talk down to them and, and just try to mess them over when we're at our most selfish and self-centered. God already knew and his blood covered that too. He already knew and he says, come to me, I love you, and together I'm going to make you a better person. And I will not stop. The Bible says he's not going to stop until the day he completes his task. I'm not going to be in heaven the person I am today. Thank God. I don't want to be. God already knew, and he loves you anyways. God already knew. And you know that, that prayer you gave that you thought was such a big deal? Oh, Lord, I, I'm going to surrender my heart to you now. How miserable and pathetic that is. God of this universe. Do you know that there are, if you take all the sands on all the beaches, every grain of sand, just pick up one handful of sand. All the sand on all the beaches, do you know there's more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the planet Earth? You are dealing with a bigger God than you know. And that God humbled himself to die for our sins, humbled himself to die because we're messed up and we're ornery. And then we come before God, oh, Lord, I'm going to accept your gift of what? Even, even our prayers of repentance are miserable. Awesome God, and we come and act like we're doing such a great thing when we, when we give our hearts to him. We owe him everything, everything. In, and that's so, you know, God of the universe who created everything, coming and humbling himself and dying for us. And in, I give you everything, and that's like nothing <laughs> compared to what you've given to me. Jesus, listen, I'm going to say something you've heard before. Please listen. Jesus loves you. He does. This is the reality. He got hammered to that thing for you. Jesus loves you. 
Now, we're studying in, in Sunday school class about loving God. Now, now, Jesus loves us unconditionally, but how do we show our love to him? Well, in Sunday school class, we're talking about Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. So we show our obedience, we show our love for God by, he's saying, this is the way my children should live. And instead of saying, no way, instead of saying that, we say, okay, you see better than me. I want to live like one of your children. I don't want to live this way to become your child, remember, because we're already saved by grace. But I want to love this way because I am your child and your ways are higher than my ways. And then Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. Take up my cross and follow me. And that's what a Christian is, a follower. Jesus leads and we follow. Again, because his ways are better than our ways. And this is how we show love back to God. There's, there's ways we can show love to God in this life we can't show in heaven. Uh, in, in heaven, you're not going to be able to evangelize anybody. You, you, you're fr we're afraid of rejection, right? Ah, what if I tell people I love Jesus? What are they going to think? We're just here for a short time. Heaven is eternity. Heaven, everybody already loves Jesus. If you want to face rejection, deny yourself, and try to love people into heaven, you've got to do it now. You're not getting any younger. I'm not. In heaven, we're not going to be able to uh, sacrifice and give God a, a portion of our income and say, God, this is, this is what I want to give you because I love you. In heaven... Here's a big one. You ever notice how you can tell a mom loves her kids because, man, she's got to suffer. And a dad loves his family because, man, he's going to work when he doesn't feel like it. He's, he's got to suffer. Do you ever notice there's a correlation between suffering? You've got to do something difficult. Like Jerry and Adam and everybody else has gone home. They're out working on the gutters yesterday. Going above and beyond to show love. There's something about not just going for our own comfort, but actually going out and doing something difficult that demonstrates love. You're not going to be able to suffer for Jesus in heaven. Right now, you've got a migraine or you've got a heart murmur, and you're still going to smile and be a blessing to the people around you. Isn't that beautiful? You can't do that in heaven. You're going to be fine. Right now, we can have financial difficulty, uh, emotional difficulties, all these troubles. And if we say, God, I want you to sanctify this trial, I, I'm going to suffer in this world, and either I'm going to suffer and my suffering means nothing, or I'm going to suffer trying to love you and love other people. And God, use this suffering for your glory, because you're going to suffer either way. So either you suffer and you just pout about it, or you go through suffering and try to love God and love people through it. You can't do that in heaven. If you want to show that love to God, we have to do it now. So there are ways we can show our love to God now that we're not going to be able to, to do in eternity. But we have to remember, we can never forget we're not earning God's love. Before you ever did anything for him, Jesus died for you. Right? We, we understand this chronologically, right? Right? Our good deeds don't buy more love from God. God says, I love you, you're my child, and this is the way my children should live. And then we say, oh, if I do these things, he's going to love me more, and now I'm better than these. Or we say, oh, I'm so miserable, I'm, I'm wretched, I'm, miserable. I can't, I'm not measured enough. And God says, come on, get up. We've got to escape from this mentality of thinking God loves us more when we're good and God loves us less when we mess up. Because it's not true. God's love is so magnificent, he loves us all the time. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Take this home and remember it every day. Imagine uh, someone catching you at your most self-centered, vile moment. You're just being nasty, horrible. And this person comes over and gives you the biggest hug, and it doesn't diminish their love for you at all. Imagine somebody who loves you more than your mom and dad if you had good parents who loved you. 
Imagine somebody that you ignore, you avoid. When you do interact with them, you try to manipulate them. What can I get out of them? Uh, they're kind of famous, they're kind of popular, so you use them to say, uh, for your own image, for your own benefit. You've treated this person poorly all your life. Well, you're in trouble. And there's a, you're in front of a firing squad. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna take you out. And this guy says, wait a second. I'm going to take his place. I'm going to take her place. Substitute me in. Tag. And they go in and they take the bullets for you. Imagine someone who loves you more than your dog loves you. No matter what you've done, glad to see you. Brothers and sisters, did you know that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren? Are you living a condemned life, feeling beat up all the time? Sometimes you don't want to pray, sometimes you don't want to go to church, sometimes you don't want to read your Bible because you're embarrassed? Well, get over yourself. God already knew all that when he took you and said, this one's my daughter, this one's my son. God already knew all of it. God loves you, except the cross. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. It's absolutely impossible, isn't it, to talk about an infinite God's love in, uh, in an hour <laughs> with human language. Romans chapter 8 from verse 31. Talking about how God, the people have come to faith in God, it's been predestined, it's their destiny if you put your faith in God, you will be conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. You will become a better person. God will make you into the glorious person he intended you to be. And then verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us? You feeling beat up? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how he, will, how he will not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who can judge us? It is God who is the judge. It is God who justifies. Who then can condemn us? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. <coughs> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Can any of these, he's saying, can any of these separate us? You know why he's saying those things? Because that's the world the first century church lived in. And today, outside of the United States, maybe Western Europe, a few places around the world, the Christian church is facing these very same things again. Churches being burnt down, Christian girls being raped, people being killed for their faith, thrown in jail because they will not deny the name of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you live in an abnormal bubble, a blip in history. All the time in, in the past and all around us today, Christians must suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And what do we suffer for? Oh, I can't find my favorite TV show. Another bill? The worship team didn't sound the way you wanted them to? You don't like the color of carpet at church? I don't know. What? What are we suffering for? Well, we're, we're really talented at finding reasons to feel persecuted, aren't we? Suffering. He says, all these things, are any of these trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, any of these things going to be able to separate you? Because, as it's written, you know, for your sake, God, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. This is the reality for Christians. No, in all these things, even when these things are happening, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. 
through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, death, nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else from all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our Lord. So what can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Let's go about this from another angle. What can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. How about if I stand over here? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Then why do we live feeling like we're separated from God's love all the time? Well, because we're not believing Scripture. We're not believing God's love. It's like it's too good to be true. Better love than mine, knowing a good deal when you see one. We just finished a series on the end times, uh, but as we pointed out, over 10% of the Bible deals with the topic of the end times, the end of days. So when we study the Bible, we're really never really done with the topic. Christianity, it's an apocalyptic faith. And we're supposed to look forward to the second coming just like a young bride looks forward to her wedding day. This God that nothing can separate us from his love, look forward to the day he comes on a white horse and says, come on, you're coming with me. You're coming with me. This world, this sickness, this death, this, this frustration, this, this, this things we struggle with, the bitterness, the anger, the, the loss, the pain, the sorrow. Do you ever feel like, man, this world's not right. I wasn't made for this. The reason is that you were made for Eden. You were made for a better place. That's why you feel you don't fit in here because we weren't made for this. And Jesus is to say, come with me. I'm going to take you away from all this. Something better in store. Jesus is coming again for the redeemed, and that's a good thing. The redeemed, what does that mean? When you've been redeemed by the blood. When you redeem something, you pay for it, you buy it out of the pawn shop or something. Uh, we, our lives have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, not money, not gold, but by the precious blood of, of, of Jesus Christ. And as we wait for that day when the one who loves us comes to take us away, and it may be this week or it could be 100 years from now, we should be living our lives to love God in response and love other people because it's easy to love some God you can't see. Jesus says, if you want to love me, take care of the thirsty, take care of the hungry. If you want to love me, let's love the people around us. And if we aren't sharing the message of the kingdom, guess what? We're not loving God or people. Can I repeat that? Now, I'm going to repeat it anyways. We should be living our lives to love God and other people. Love God. He died to build a family. Love other people. Everybody's going to live for eternity, either their eternal damnation or eternal heaven. If we aren't sharing the gospel, <coughs> the message how people can get right with Jesus, we aren't loving God or people. We say we believe in heaven and hell. We should live like it. Last week in his, I think, excellent message, Dad focused on Matthew 25, 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, modern Christianity oftentimes focuses on that second part, don't we? No one knows the day or the hour. No one knows the day or the hour. No one, every time we talk about end times, no one knows the day or the hour. But you know what? The early church focused on the first part, keep watch. Keep watch. Jesus is coming again, and Jesus taught us to observe the signs of the times. Just like you know the weather when you look to the sky, we're supposed to look to the sky, we're supposed to observe the signs of the times. Not knowing the exact day or hour isn't used to justify not keeping an, a weather eye in the sky. Jesus' intent here is not to say, since you don't know when I'm coming back, don't think about it. But clearly his intent is, since you don't know when I'm coming back, think about it all the time. 2 Timothy 4.8, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. Well, that's because it's Paul, right? The great apostle Paul, he said, he's bragging, it's in store for me. I'm going to get this crown 
from Jesus. When he comes back, he's going to be a, a crown of righteousness. There is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Oh, it goes on. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In your heart, just can't wait for Jesus to get back. Can't wait to see him come and set things right when justice rolls down. When we have a, a good king. Again, ours is an apocalyptic faith. And we aren't, and if we're not yearning for Christ's return, we're doing it wrong. We have a good God in a messed up world. And he's coming back to straighten things out, me too. And I can't wait to become the person God sees in me. You ever feel like that? can't wait to become the person God sees in you, the person God designed you to be. I was talking to Eiko last night about baptism, and we both ended up crying. And uh, one of the things we spoke about, you know, I've been a Christian for more than four decades. I'm 46. I've been preaching since I was 16. That's 30 years of preaching which I'm embarrassed about right now, you'd think 40 years of saying I follow Jesus and I'm not close to the man that I wish I was. In fact, the gap between who I wish Dan was and who Dan really is is huge. And guess what? My standards are a lot lower than God's standards. 40 years of Christianity. And I can still be selfish. I can still be a hardhead. I could be so difficult to be around. Don't want to be. That's not who I, when I think about myself and who I want to be, it's always this good guy. Jesus says, come follow me. And I want to say yes. He says, who shall I send? And I want to say, how about me? Jesus says, deny yourself. And I said, I want to do that. Well, you know what? My confidence is not here. My confidence is not here. If I were to, please listen. I'm going to heaven. I'm standing for you today. I am going to heaven. Not because that I'm so good. I'm going to heaven because he's so good. And he gave me a promise that everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. Everyone. I figure I fit in that category. I want to see Jesus because he's so good. I'm not looking at my goodness. I'm looking at his goodness. He's so good. He's so wonderful. So perfect. And I just want to follow that. <coughs> and I am look forward to him keeping his promise that he's going to make me just like him. Now, have you ever thought, maybe I don't want to see God? Second coming sounds real scary in the Bible. There's this massive destruction and a lot of, a lot of so hardship, a lot of sorrow. So why, why would I look forward to Jesus coming back? I believe that he really does care about me. I believe that he enjoys being with me. I believe that like all of his children, Everybody who puts his faith in him, that he's, he's whooping and hollering and celebrating over us with shouts of joy. I believe that even though he knows me better than I know myself, he says, Dan, I love you. I want, to be, I want you to be with me for eternity. The first time Jesus came humbly, remember? Jesus came, he was born as a little baby. Can you imagine king of the universe born as a baby? And not... And, and, just a little speck of a planet, not even a king. Now, becoming a, being born in a king's palace would still be so miserably low for Christ. But being born in a manger, and he was born to humble circumstances, born to suffer, born to face rejection, born to face scorn, born, born to die in agony because I'm so hard-headed and arrogant. When he visits our planet next time, he's coming in power and glory. He 
you're either going to be on his side or you're going to be looking for a hole to hide in. It's going to be a day of terror, but it doesn't have to be. And let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. If you can't find Matthew chapter 26, it's right after Matthew 25. There you go. Right, exactly. Well, I didn't want to get it too confusing. But. Matthew 26, so we're going to look at the first 25 verses. Jesus just talking about uh, eternal life, eternal death, eternal punishment. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. You've heard that too many times before. How would you feel if your very, very best friend says, As you know, two days from now I'm going to be killed? kind of would like to hang out with you for these last two days. I've been really looking forward to sharing the last meal with you guys. I only got two days left. As you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be killed on a Roman cross. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. So God's plan is he's going to be publicly crucified when all the world is coming into Jerusalem, all the Jewish people, all the way from India and Spain and Persia. Everybody's there to celebrate Passover, and that's when Jesus can be crucified. The other guys, from a human point of view, they said, we've got to kill him, but we're not going to do it now. There's too many people, and there could be a riot. Guess who wins? While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, what in the heck is a, is a law-abiding Jew doing in the home of Simon the leper where you can be ceremonially unclean? <coughs> Jesus is establishing love here, the love principle. He imagined the Messiah. A, a leper has to be excluded from society. They were always had to be separate from everyone else. <coughs> And now God in flesh comes, and he says, I'd like to stay with you for a while. It, it, it's just this toss-out line in the Bible. Jesus staying stay in the home of Simon the leper. What did that do for Simon? And also, I wonder why it didn't say Simon the former leper. <laughs> Jesus is going around healing everybody. I don't know. But anyways, uh, maybe he did heal him. But Jesus is there in this home. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar a very expensive perfume which she poured on his head as he was reclining at a table. It, her love for him, it just, it just breaks out of her and she, she has to give probably out of her poverty. She's giving what little she has. She's pouring out this expensive perfume on Jesus just as an act of devotion, an act of love. He's so good. He's so wonderful. He's pouring her perfume on his head. When his disciples, who are his disciples? These are his best friends. He just said, I'm going to die in two days. Let's hang out together. And they're seeing their friend who's in anguish. He knows what he's going through. And this woman is pouring perfume on him. They said, why are you wasting this? Why are you wasting this, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor and we know that Judas was in charge of the, the treasury, and he was actually taking the money for the poor for himself as well. But all the disciples here are like, yeah, why, why are you wasting that? There's good ways to spend money, and there's bad ways, and pouring it out on Jesus, that's a waste. We heard about one of the speakers, uh, Jerry was talking about, who talked about finances, and he, he told this story, and I thought I knew where this story was going to go. He, he talked about $30,000 that he doesn't have anymore, and I thought, well, yeah, because he spent it on the church, and... We do that. I, uh, you guys probably know that I used more of that, more money than that, to help start foundation. Never thought it was a waste. Guess what? His story is horrible. He had a money-making venture that was it could not fail. Now you've all heard that before. Oh yeah, the investment that can't fail, right? Guess what? Everybody else who made this investment didn't fail. They all became millionaires. 
they were trying, dry, dry, I don't understand what it was, but they had to purchase some, some bandwidth that they could then resell later or something. And uh, Jerry's laughing at me because I don't know what I'm talking about. It has to do with cell phones. So anyways, uh, everybody else who, who did this, many, many people all across the United States all became millionaires. His group did it, and instead of purchasing uh, the bandwidth for $180,000, the guy typed in 18 million by mistake, and they all lost their shirts. <coughs> so his $30,000 is just gone. That is wasted money. When we use our money for the things of God, that's not wasted money. So this woman pours this out lavishly on Jesus Christ, and his own disciples say, what's up with that? Aware of this. So Jesus knows, as he's facing this, his end, as he's facing the cross, the author of life was not suicidal. The author of life loved life more than anybody, and he was going to lay it down for us. As he's going through this, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said, why are you bothering this woman? Isn't that interesting? He wasn't offended for himself. He was offended for her. She's done this great deed, this great act of generosity. He said, why are you bothering her? I love that. Jesus, even now, was not feeling like, what's wrong with you guys? Can't you see somebody's loving on me, unlike you? <laughs> but his focus is on the woman. Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And maybe there's a little bit of unlike you guys there. The poor you're always going to have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume out on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Uh, she probably wasn't thinking that way, but Jesus was. <laughs> How would you like to have been in that room? Here's a guy knowing he's going to his death. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And right now, today, this morning, check. <laughs> we just did it. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, you know, it's not a lot of people name their kids Judas anymore. Went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What are you willing to give me if I betray my master? What are you willing to give me if I betray the one who loves me more than anyone? What are you willing to give me? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go, to the city of a, go into the city of a, to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. Again, this is on Jesus' mind. He, the countdown is on. The teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. He's not going to just do it. I'm not just going to celebrate the Passover. This is with the people he loves, the people that have been with him. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. <clears throat> when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. Isn't that a beautiful picture? He's, this is his last moments on earth, and he's leaning back, and he's with these 12, the inner core. And while they were eating, he said, you know what, guys? Truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. They were very sad began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord, no way, it's not me. And he, he knows the weakness of their faith. And how did that feel to have all these people say, not, it's never going to be me. No, my love, I love you so much. My faith is so strong. And he's looking, knowing that when the shepherd is taken, the sheep will scatter. When he's taken, they're going to run for the hills. Jesus replied, the one who's dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as is written about him, just like the Old Testament prophesied, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who will, would betray him, looked at him and said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Oh, that's cold. Isn't, wouldn't that have been the time to fall down in tears of repentance? Jesus knows. Wow, he knows. What am I doing? If, if, if Judas had repented at that moment, guess what? He would have been accepted into God's family. Instead, he looks right at Jesus. He said, no, not me, because he's a liar. He's wicked, and he doesn't love, have any love for Jesus. When I was reading this, it hit me this, this last week, 
the last two weeks actually, this hit me harder than I ever. You know, you read the Bible and some things, you knew it, but it kind of just speaks to you more clearly than ever before. I never saw this. I was caught up in the passion story, Jesus going to cross, Jesus going to cross. I missed the fact his disciples are failing him again and again and again and again right up to the cross. And who wrote this? Matthew, one of his disciples. And he's showing how miserable they were. Failing Jesus right up to the end. Why this waste? Extravagance, love poured out on Jesus. And they say, why this waste? Nearing the end of his life, this great discipler who's invested in these men, they should have their act together. <coughs> if Jesus is your discipler, you shouldn't sin anymore, right? They're still arguing who is the best. They're still arguing <coughs> who's more righteous. Excuse me. And now one of his hand-picked disciples is going to betray him for 30 silver pieces. Well, that's, how would it feel to be Jesus? You know, you, you're discipling people. You want to see them getting their lives together. And next thing they know, they sell you out for 30 bucks or whatever it is translated. And look you right in the eye and say, oh, no, that's not me. As a side note, what do we sell Jesus out for? How do we betray Jesus? Going to indulge in a little self-pity party here, a little anger, entertainment opportunities. Uh, what do we betray Jesus for? I want to hold on to this grudge. I'm not going to let it go. Selling Jesus out. That's not my sermon today, but I want us to think about that. Jesus, Judas betrayed him for 30 silver pieces. Judas eats with Jesus and lies to him when he could have confessed. In the coming weeks, we're going to see Jesus asking his disciples to pray with them. Right before the cross, could you just pray with me? Just one hour, can you pray with me? And they fall asleep. And he comes back to him, and you can hear the pain in his voice. He says, couldn't you guys just pray with me one hour? I need you guys right now. Time of his greatest need, and they're not very helpful. How about when your wife, does she know I need some attention right now? How about your husband? Doesn't he ever think about me? How about your children? Why don't they care? How about your best friends, your so-called friends? Where are they? I'm, I'm, go I'm hurting right now. Where are my friends? Jesus' friends letting him down each step of the way to the cross. I'm not excusing their behavior or blaming it on the devil, but I wonder if the devil wasn't trying to discourage Jesus. Get him, get him. Why, are you, why are you dying for these people anyways? Jesus will be betrayed with a kiss from his former disciple. He's going to say, Judas, with a kiss? You're going to come up and kiss me and call me teacher as you betray me? Oh, Lord, Lord, love you, Jesus. Turn around and betray him. Jesus says, are you going to? Actually praise me in church and turn around and do this? In one of his inner circle, Peter is going to deny him three times. He's going to cuss and swear and say, I don't even know this guy. And then he's going to run out and just weep bitter tears of disappointment and sorrow and pain because he denied the one he knew loved him the most. And guess what? Guess what? Still, Jesus loved his disciples, and he was still willing to die for them. And when he comes back to life, he restores the relationship with the eleven. He makes Peter a pastor, and he eats with them at least on a couple different times, sitting on the beach cooking fish for them. They failed again and again and again. And he comes back and says, why didn't you guys care about me? No, he doesn't. He, 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 he comes back and says, what was wrong with you guys? You guys were scared. No, he doesn't. <coughs> He comes back, and they see him on the beach, and he's cooking them fish. Come on, let's eat together. Brothers and sisters, have you ever let Jesus down? Do you feel like your life is a series of failure? He wants to broil fish for you. He wants to sit on the beach with you. He wants to talk with you. 
you don't know how I've let Jesus down. I don't have to because he knows and he loves you anyways. And he died for you anyways. And the one who died for you when you were his enemy is not going to kick you out of the family now that you're his son, you're his daughter. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. <coughs> this was just blew me away when I started thinking of all the failures the disciples did up to the cross and still he loved them and he comes back from death just to love on them, just to bless them. They failed. He loved. We fail in our love. Jesus does not fail. He always loves all the time. And he loves you at your worst moment. Never ever feel like, oh no, now I can't go to church, now I can't pray, now I can't read my Bible. Listen, it's not the Holy Spirit who's telling you, don't go to church, you're not good enough. It is not the Holy Spirit that's saying, how dare you pray? God just saw what you did. It's not the Holy Spirit who's saying, you don't deserve to be with God's people. You can't read that Bible. It's a holy book. Who are you? That's not the Holy Spirit. That's demonic. It's demonic. It is a lie from hell that Jesus can't love you. He went to the cross for you. You're not garbage. He's not pushing you to the curb. Jesus is not tired of you. Now, I think the proper response is to be sick and tired of our own sin nature. Sick of that, right? Amen? But Jesus is not tired with who we are, and he will make us into the people he's planned for us to be. The truth is, the devil doesn't want you to know how much God loves you, and the devil doesn't want you in church. And, the, and you know what you can do? Go to church, love God, love other people, start living God's way because we're his child. We're his child not because of the things we do. We're his child because of what Jesus did for us. And now I say, I want to live like one of your children, Lord. And when I fail, when I fall down, guess what? The grace that saved me on the day I was saved is still there for me today. And it was still going to be there for me tomorrow. So I'm going to pop back right up. I'm going to get right back up because of grace. And I'm going to keep striving to love God and love other people. And I'm not going to turn away or walk away. I'm not going to put my back to the cross. The devil doesn't want you to know how much Jesus loves you. But God wants you to know how much he loves you. And that's why he reached out his hands and was nailed to a cross. So we could have eternal life. That we could be with him for eternity. You ever, you ever have friends or neighbors over, a family over, and you think, well been a day, had enjoyed having over, going to enjoy quiet this evening. How about they, they come and stay for a, a few months? It's good to bless people. You happy? Yeah, it's nice to have your place. Jesus says, I want you to come stay with me. Why don't you just stay forever? God loves us. So what are you going to think about this week? God loves you. When you feel beat up, when you don't like yourself sometimes, well, repent. <laughs> Start treating people better. Start living God's way. That's what, the, what, that's what grace is for, so we can confess and get up. But through it all, we're never, ever, ever going to forget or turn our back or, or look away from God's love. I'm here today because of the grace of God. I'm going to be here tomorrow because of the grace of God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for loving hard-headed, stubborn, uh, wicked, selfish people such as ourselves. God, you're so good. You're so good, and we want to be like you. And God, you love us when we don't deserve it. God, help us to love people when they don't deserve it. God, we want to be people of grace. We want to be people of truth. We want to be people just like you. Thank you for saving us from ourselves. And thank you, God, that we have this promise from you that you started something good in our lives, and you're not going to stop. You're never going to stop. And you are going to complete what you've started, Lord. And someday, Lord, we're going to be free from all the selfishness and the self-centeredness. We're going to be free from this flesh, this sin nature, Lord God. And we're going to be free to love you and love everyone around us just as you always intended us to be. Lord God, we're looking forward to that day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Foundation Bible Church 
Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.